how's it going everybody? Welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Ending Explained, we're looking at the brand new sequel to The Babysitter, The Babysitter Killer Queen. Two years after defeating a satanic cult led by his babysitter B, Cole once again has to outsmart the forces of evil when old enemies unexpectedly return. I did quite enjoy the original The Babysitter, and while no means perfect, it was an absolute blast to watch. And of course, everyone loves Samara Weaving. However, it was also one that I didn't really feel like needed a sequel, you know. It was pretty complete story-wise, so I was admittedly a bit hesitant at where things would go in Killer Queen, as a big part of many horror sequels is simply having to justify a reason for existing in the first place. Do you do the same basic thing again, or try to switch things up? Either way can be risky. And fortunately, Killer Queen manages to balance both giving us familiar beats and moments from the first film, while also pushing things into a new and different direction. Also, the real name of the game here seems to be to crank everything up that people liked about the first one. Juvenile humor, gory, blood-soaked deaths, and a very kind of hyper-frenetic energy. All of this has been pushed even further in the sequel, and while at times it doesn't always work, fortunately it succeeds more often than not. It is a great follow-up for fans of the first film. There are a few story choices in particular at the end that I really enjoyed, and really opens up things into a possible part three. It has always been director McGee's intent to make this a trilogy, and we'll talk a bit more about that at the end. For now, let's reunite with our old pals in The Babysitter Killer Queen, and see how things are going in the aftermath of the first movie, breaking down Cole's new journey and its many twists, as well as explaining the ending and how it sets us up for the possible third and final Babysitter film. Picking up two years after the events of the first film, we find Cole is still traumatized by his experience that night with his demonic babysitter B and her cohorts. Grabbing some milk, the liquid turns blood red and overflows onto the floor. His dad discovering him and asking if he's okay, followed by a brief flash of the ever shirtless Max. And no, he's not okay, as no one believes him about what happened at his house. As it turns out, there was no evidence left behind to verify his story, including B's body turning up missing. So even though he conquered his childhood fears, he is still an outcast at school because now everyone thinks that he's nuts, getting harassed by a ginger boy there, equating his position to that of Sarah Connor in T2, trying to convince everyone everyone of the robot uprising. The worst part, he admits, is that he still misses B even after everything that happened. He returns to guidance counselor Big Carl for more nuggets of advice, which all pretty much boils down to that Cole needs to get laid. And I'm not sure if his corduroy suit straight out of a Wes Anderson flick he constantly wears is helping too much in that arena. Now a few years older, Cole's having to struggle with his developing hormones, an obvious crush on his neighbor Mel, who really looks like a mini-me version of B, seeing that time literally slows down when he's talking to her. Unfortunately, she's dating the brain-dead Jimmy, who rolls up with his other pals Diego and Boom Boom. And I'm like, how long are these guys gonna stick around? They're gonna be exploding before too long, I have a feeling. Another new student has a much larger impact on Cole's trajectory. During a discussion on Faust, which is kind of the basic premises of these movies, the quirky, no-nonsense Phoebe makes a grand first impression, telling everyone in the class that she's pregnant, but is given faith when looking around the room about the child's future. Pretty serious sarcasm for this room full of dead-eyed kids, and also learn that she's from a program that helps to assimilate kids who were once in Juvenile Hall, letting us know that Phoebe has had some kind of troubled past. She orders the same ginger jerk out of his seat, and spot a telltale black cat tattoo on her wrist, the same that B sported in the first film, informing us they must have some kind of connection. Cole's parents are also struggling with what to do with him after the incident, assuming that he has lost touch with reality, and have put him on a slew of medications until his episodes stop. At least he has Melanie on his side, calling on the computer with a question about a school paper, which is awkwardly interrupted by her noticing a big bottle of lotion behind him, and taken to a whole new level of cringe when his dad barges in, worried that he interrupted a moment. And dad asks him what is the deal with him and her, Cole muttering that she doesn't see him that way. They again discuss his pills, which he knows that Cole doesn't want to take, but asks him to just make an effort for him and his mom. He understands that his parents want 
wants him to admit that it was all in his head, Dad reminding him that it's through adversity that we gain our strength. But Cole is still adamant that it really happened, his dad blinking, okay, in response, still not believing him one bit. He finds out the next morning that they are electing for a much more drastic measures than simply medication for his problem. Finding a pamphlet for a psychiatric facility along with a note marking 1 p.m. today, uh-oh. He discusses this with Mel, who has a solution to his little problem. Come with her and her pals to the lake this weekend. Cole stammers that he needs to ask his parents, but she encourages him to not ask and just do it. Just like how she took her dad's precious car. Oh no, not again, he's gonna be pissed about that. His pill bottle falls out and Cole is uncomfortable, but she brings up that everyone is on something nowadays, rattling off the meds other students are taking for various afflictions. What about the new girl, he wonders, and she draws a blank, Mel unable to pin her down just yet, but has heard rumors that she killed her parents. Phoebe opens up her locker to a surprise, a rabbit with a key ring reading home sweet home, along with a fortune cookie wrapper with instructions attached. Back in class, Cole is distracted by a silly flip book Phoebe has scrawled, and the teacher notices, asking him to summarize their discussion. He gets to his feet and immediately trips like a doofus, seeing that his shoelaces have been tied together. Way to go, nice prank bro. And still manages to sum things up pretty well. The story's meaning being that taking shortcuts is a cop-out. Getting something without working for it is unrewarding. As of course, this applies to Cole's next stage of character progression. Earning what he desires through hard work and sacrifice. No shortcuts. As class ends, Teach tells Cole that his parents are here and waiting for him, meaning he's gotta make his decision right quick. Looking down the hall, he considers either getting locked up or looking over to Mel dangling the keys. Yeah, seems like a no-brainer to me. Hopping in her dad's over-the-top sports car, they unite hands, shouting they're like Thelma and Louise, the moment spoiled by Jimmy and the others showing up. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Cole's parents search for him at Juan's house next door. He's unworried as Mel tends to ditch all the time, and his dad is okay with it, relieved that he's at least out being social. But when revealing that they took his car, Juan is actually surprised, threatening if they mess up his car again, they're both dead. As we remember, Cole triumphantly destroyed Juan's other car at the end of the first movie, using it to pin B in and everything. Arriving at the lake, it's chock full of a bunch of partying dopes, Cole looking pretty out of place in his suit. Nearby, Phoebe shows up, having gotten a ride in a semi, and straight just jacks some dude's jet ski and barrels off, which was actually pretty sweet. Cole checks his phone from 1993 and naturally has no signal. Looking uncertain, he tells Mel that he's not going to go, shrugging that they're normal and he's not. She tells him, so what? If you give up, then they win. His innocence is what makes him special, and says that she's not leaving without him, wooing him into tagging along. Gathering into a party barge, navigating some pretty spooky waters, the gang is playing a card game of two minutes in heaven, calling it more realistic than seven. And on the very first turn, it results in Mel and Cole having to do some smooching in the closet. And Jimmy, her boyfriend, isn't worried at all, joking that he probably doesn't even have a dick. They passionately make out in the closet, and their time quickly runs out to Cole's dissatisfaction. Diego, out of nowhere, brings up the whole blood cult thing, Mel trying to stop him and warning that they're not supposed to talk about it. But he keeps egging Cole on, explaining that the group never got far enough in the ritual to actually mix the blood. Mel chimes in to leave it alone, and just wants to have some fun, mentioning the devil's book that they used. Ah, oh, but she shouldn't know about that, as Cole never previously mentioned it. Whoops, Mel, looks like you spilled the beans. And she takes a hook to Boom Boom's throat, understanding that she made the same deal as B and the others, and the other pals of hers are in on this too. Looks like you got set up pretty hard there, Coley boy. Mel laments that Cole was supposed to just take his meds and pass out, making it much easier to extract his precious blood. But now we'll just have to take his blood and kill him. They are given some extra assistance from a somewhat surprising source, as each of B's crew that were all killed pop back up one by one. Cole is understandably confused used as he saw them all die. And they say they are dead, and explain that they have to complete the ritual by sunrise, or it's back to limbo for another two years until they can try again. Ready to descend upon him, he tries to defend himself with a hook as they all huddle around him. Luckily Phoebe shows up, and Cole accuses her of being in on it too, but it turns out she was just here for some gas for the jet ski. And when surveying the scene, decides it's best to excuse herself. Mm, no thank you, I uh, will be taking my leave, uh, but please. Cole is able able to get to the roof and takes the slide down onto the jet ski right before she was leaving. As the others launch a harpoon at them, the two fleeing into the moonlit waters. Phew, that was close. Making it to refuge on a beach, Phoebe questions what the hell that was all about. Cole filling her in on the whole deal here, and she's just relieved that they're not zombies. He goes on about seeing them come 
back to life. Her thinking they must be made of some kind of metal alloy. Cole impressed that she knows about Terminator 2. Uh, who isn't? Come on, everyone loves that. They waste no time in concocting a way to track them down. Everyone annoyed that they got away. But Mel reminds them that it was them that screwed this whole thing up the first time, and that's the only reason that she was called in, to fix their problems. Way to go, gang. She pulls out a lighter and tosses it onto their fuel residue in the water, igniting the whole way to the jet ski and blowing it up to kingdom come. Phoebe is ready to run off again, divulging to Cole that she came here for another personal reason, and hikes through foggy rocks, coming to a man playing guitar by a fire. She yells out, requesting a ride to town, which he is happy to oblige once his wife comes back from collecting firewood, inviting her to get closer and warm up. Oh, this doesn't seem suspicious at all. Thanks, strange man. After a few moments of hesitation, she asks when his wife will be back, him saying that she left 10 years ago, so probably not anytime soon. Cole jumps up, happy that they're making s'mores and rambles, then pulls the man's hat down, grabbing her hand and gets to his car, seeing that he used the old tied up shoelaces bit to gain a lead. Doesn't help too much, as Sonya is right in front of the car waiting and wielding a flamethrower, and we're treated to an extremely brief backstory of how she was first recruited. She's seen hard at work doing makeup on a cadaver when B approaches at the stairs, hearing her saying, you came for me. And that's it. Wow. I mean, I do appreciate them adding these little backstory things, but holy heck, that's brief. That tells us only the most basic of things. Oh, well, whatever. She turns a flamethrower on the dude, scorching him, and then focuses on them. They speed up and crash right into her and back up over her as well, but she's unfazed. They ram her again, Sonya hanging onto the hood, and Cole does donuts to try to get her off. They smash into some rocks, pinning her against them, and a surfboard on the roof gets loose and decapitates her. Woo-wee! He tries to back up, but they're stuck in the sand. Hearing distant chatter of the others, they decide to hide under the car just as they arrive on scene. Mel is disappointed in Sonya's failure, and the younger and older group get into a bickering match, deciding to split up to see who can find them first, going their separate ways. Meanwhile, a rattlesnake has found its way under the car, getting closer and closer to Cole. Right as it jumps at him, Phoebe catches it inches from his face. This makes a sound calling the group over to investigate. Just about to look under the car and expose them, she places the snake right there, giving Diego a big scare, running into Jimmy's arms for safety. They leave to keep searching, allowing Cole and Phoebe to escape towards her destination, a cabin in the woods that they can lay low at until sunrise. Cole grumbling, great, no one gets killed at a cabin in the woods, right? Along the way, she thanks him for saving her, him apologizing as this must be the worst night of her life. But she says she's been through worse, having seen someone die before. Cole asks does she believe that everything happens for a reason, but she shuts this down, feeling there's no soulmates, no Santa Claus, them's just the breaks. He chortles that's a pretty bleak outlook for an expectant mother, and she reveals that was all a lie just to get people to leave her alone. Wow, smart thinking. Passing on rocks above where Allison is hanging out, it alerts her to their location. And then we have a quick moment of how B enlisted Allison. She wanted to be a journalist, as she says, Geraldo, but fuckable. Problem is, she has no talent whatsoever, and is rejected for the job, throwing a big old temper tantrum, interrupted by B there saying her name. She jumps down, pointing a gun at them, and Cole attempts to appeal to her ego, asking her to think of the great story of her saving them. She just has to let them go. She's not interested, firing a shot that happens to ricochet off the rock and land right in her boob, moaning again, which as we remember happened in the first film. She leaps down after them, but gets trapped in between the rocks, blindly firing and yelling for them to get her down, which they do, pulling on her until her head separates from her body, and for good measure, a random giant boulder smushes her as well. Max then appears with an axe, swinging wildly. Phoebe gets the gun, but it's out of bullets. He goes for Cole, who uses Allison's leg to defend himself. Cole stabs him in the back with one of her shoes, and just about to make a break for it, Phoebe runs back for her backpack, doing a pretty sweet slide right under Max's swing. Fleeing from the shirtless psycho, they happen upon a speedboat, but they just gotta figure out the code to get it going. Some guy shows up yelling for them to get out of there and is promptly impaled with a big knife through the back. We then see Max's grand desires are about as simple as you'd expect. Seen working shirtless, of course, at a fast food place. A customer complains about her fries, and he holds back the urge to throw hot oil in her face. B appearing, asking if he wants to kill somebody. And I guess that's it. He just wants to kill people. Big ambitions there, meat man. My goodness. John joins them, encouraging his pal to get them, and knows the song by the band the boat is named after, the 80s classic Ginny, 8675309, which luckily is also the passcode to the boat. 
boat. They get going and Max hops on the inner tube looking like he's having an absolute blast. He starts climbing up the rope and getting closer to them and Phoebe goes through her bag pulling out silly string and stops the boat. She sprays him in the face with the silly string and then takes her Zippo spraying more creating a makeshift flamethrower sending him toppling in the water but doesn't really slow him down. She cranks the engine on and Max is pulled under the propeller going right into his face and tearing him to absolute shreds. John smirks, yeah he made the right choice here, as Mel and the younger group walk up the pier. John warns the kid is grown up now and they're gonna have to kill him like a man. Jimmy nods in agreement, coming up with some very dodgy odds on their survival probability. And he along with Diego decide this is all a little too real for them at this point and decide to leave. Mel reminds him that they signed a deal. Diego offering bros before hoes and he spontaneously combusts. Jimmy is destroyed, shouting no at his exploded friend, and then he combusts as well, leaving just John, who reassures Mel and Satan his feet are planted right here on the ground. Don't, don't worry about me, Satan. I ain't going nowhere. Please don't explode me. She has a sat phone, allowing her to call Cole's dad, who's holed up with her dad at his place playing VR and smoking reefers. She tells him that her and Cole are fine, they just had too much to drink, and asks him to come pick them up, while Juan is still only really worried about his car. Still on the boat, Phoebe asks how long until sunrise, and using the star he can estimate about three hours, explaining how the constellations revolve around the North Star like a clock, and how he used to dream as a child of being lost in the middle of nowhere and could survive. With just his wits, Phoebe all, oh you mean like right now? And he's like, yeah, I guess. He then asks about her childhood dream, which he thinks is silly, but is to be Alice from Alice in Wonderland. To fall down a rabbit hole and wake up in a strange land, meeting crazy characters having adventures along the way. Kind of like right now, Cole asks. Well, that's convenient. Both got to fulfill their childhood dreams thanks to this crazy situation. Too bad everyone's trying to murder them. It makes it a little less fun, perhaps. John and Mel procure their own boat, and she is doing some serious posing with the lantern on the front there. Lots of tude there lady, making it to where the duo was headed, spotting a cabin up the hill. Using the key from the locker, she opens the door, revealing that this used to be her family's cabin, but that she hasn't been here in many years. Pulling away a rug, there's a cellar door hidden underneath, Phoebe suggesting their best bet is to hole up down there until the morning. Down below is what she calls her personal childhood sanctuary, her rabbit hole. As White Rabbit starts playing, appropriate as it's also about uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland, Phoebe is clutching the bunny from her locker, explaining that it was her best friend that she lost when she was six. Two days ago, it showed up in her locker with keys to the cabin, and it ends tonight written on a fortune. Changing her tune, she feels that perhaps something about tonight doesn't feel like coincidence after all. And just about to go in for a kiss, he shirks away nervously to some cassette tapes, putting on Apache by Incredible Bongo Band. Both love the song. Cole saying that he used to listen to it with his babysitter, and this time they do indeed go for a big kiss. And based on the silly stock footage, go a bit further than that as well. Things suddenly turning into a ridiculous disco-infused dance number with the entire gang for some reason, very much out of nowhere. The dads arrive to Mel, who plays coy, not revealing her true nature, and telling them that Cole has been saying weird stuff about the cult again, while Phoebe is impressed by Cole's kissing ability, figuring that he'd be bad at it, but he scoffs that he's had practice, with the girl trying to kill us, and feels that he has bad luck with girls, as they all turn out to be murderers. Phoebe chokes that his streak still stands because she killed her parents, and she she fills him in on what happened, seeing her father's truck, including the home sweet home key ring, and her precious bunny. They collide with another car and roll over the side of the hill. Phoebe was in the other car that her parents crashed into and feels responsible for their deaths. If she hadn't left her bunny at the beach, they would both still be alive. Starting to tear up, she tells him to just go on with his big speech about it not being her fault, but he says he can't say it was or wasn't. Regardless, she did go through something no little kid ever should have to go through, but as his dad told him, through Ed adversity we find strength. He deems her by far the strongest person he's ever met and admits he couldn't have made it through tonight without her. About to go in for another kiss, he hears his dad calling for him from up above. She warns him not to go up as it could be a trap, but he says even if it is, he has to help his dad. She says as long as they go up there, they better be prepared, informing him that her dad kept his hunting gear down here, but are stopped by another code to crack. She remembers numbers were written on the fortune as well, and gives it a shot, which works. Wow, thanks whoever left that rabbit. Seems 
seems to be helping them rather than impeding things tonight. They come out with war paint and crossbows ready for battle. As we learn John's story, at a music studio, he does some absolutely horrible out of key scatting. The engineer throwing his hands up in disgust and leaving. John yelling, he'll do anything. QB on the mic offering to help. That asks Cole to calm down and he shoots an arrow at John, just missing. He grabs a sword and cuts a wire inadvertently unleashing an extra pointy horn chandelier that kills him on impact. Mel enters and fakes being sensitive, telling Cole that she loves him. And Phoebe throws a knife that Mel catches easily, impressing her dad. He's had enough of all this nonsense and wants to leave, but she refuses. He attempts to ground her and she brutally slays her own father, slashing off his limbs and everything. Good gravy, woman. Phoebe and Cole split up and he tries to appeal to his dad and explain that he's not crazy. He appears supportive, telling him to come in for a hug, but it was just a trick, getting him with a syringe of sedatives, instantly getting woozy. As Cole fades out, he pleads that he doesn't understand and has to save her. Elsewhere, Mel pursues Phoebe, throwing the knife into a signpost, things suddenly turning into an extremely over-the-top Street Fighter 2 referencing fight. With him twirling in the air, doing impossible maneuvers and shooting fireballs out of their hands and shit, here, they lost me, I gotta admit. I really was like, what the hell is going on? on, dude. This is completely out of nowhere and really doesn't stylistically fit with anything else in the movie. Just a very out of place momentary oddity that thankfully only lasts a few minutes, ending with Mel getting the upper hand with a switchblade to her adversary's throat. She gets tied up to a post, Mel telling her they have a lot in common, as Cole used to look at her the same way she looks at Phoebe. Her moaning, are you gonna monologue all night long? Certain that he's not coming back. Mel disagrees knowing he's a Terminator fan, so he'll definitely be back. Wink. Get the reference there? I hope so. She's not wrong either, thanks to Cole's well-meaning but bumbling stone dad. When stopping to refuel, he accidentally whacks the car, setting off the alarm and reviving an unconscious Cole. His dad pleads to let him in the car, him telling him strength is in the measure people go to for others, that he's in love with her and made a promise, and peels out, leaving his dad stranded in the middle of nowhere. Phoebe is still confused as to why she's here, as they only need Cole for the ritual, and Mel knows that by using her as bait, he's bound to show up. And right on cue, he gives her a call, telling him to meet at Parrot's Cove in 20 minutes or she's dead, her plan appearing to go exactly as intended. When he arrives, he's not looking to fight, but instead relents, taking a seat in a chair, asking her to just take his blood already in exchange for letting Phoebe go. Mel ominously states that she can't until I deliver for her. And guess who's suddenly rising out of the water, but also still somehow dry? The long-missing bee. Well, that's a pleasant surprise. Perhaps an even bigger surprise is that Phoebe knows her, and she too used to be her babysitter as a child, and had thought this whole time that she had died. Turns out B was the one driving that day of the crash that took her parents, and Phoebe was told she was the only survivor by some kind of miracle, or rather a deal with the devil, B corrects. Seeing at the hospital, the nurse talking to B post-accident was a demon in service of the Dark Lord, and the time has come to collect the debt. He groans that she was his best friend, and she smiles she had the chance to trade up. They all did, as the rest of the gang are reanimated out of vigils of some kind, looking good as new. After all that, they finally get to drawing Cole's blood into a container and mix it all up in their ritualistic chalice. Also from the climax of the first, B gravely states it's time, and they go down the line, each taking a drink from the cup, Mel in particular taking a big old gulp, instantly feeling its effect. But what about B? Waiting for a moment in anticipation, nothing seems to happen, everyone starting to wonder if it's working or not. Allison then feeling something's not right, and projectile vomits blood all over John. Yeah, that doesn't look good. That's probably not what was supposed to happen. The other starting to also cough in pain. B then realizes the problem. They need the ritual with the blood of the innocent, but perhaps Cole isn't so innocent anymore. Mel is certain that Cole is still a virgin, but not so much. Sorry, ladies, got himself a not evil girlfriend for a change and is a big old man now. Everyone starts to perish. Max not actually even mad, giving him props for finally getting laid and collapses to his death, followed by the others. John going for a last minute deathbed plea to God to spare him as he dissolves away from the outside. B watches the whole thing and can't help but laugh, while another needle drop sets the scene, killer queen by queen. Makes sense, obviously, uh, B being the killer queen and all. And Mel screams and explodes into viscera. B unties Phoebe as we learn more details of the accident and its aftermath, as well as that it was B behind everything all along, and this was actually her big master plan coming together. Sorry, Mel. Seeing she was the one that planted the rabbit in the locker, and even took some jet ski fuel as well. And then we see when Mel was enlisted, as simple as appealing to her vain nature, saying, sure, a million followers is great, but boasts, what about a billion? 
Now we know what she was all about, and then come to understand that B wasn't quite as simply defined as evil after all. At the hospital post the crash, she asks the demon nurse about young Phoebe's condition, and is told the outlook isn't good. She starts to bawl, the nurse asking what she would do to save her. Anything, she cries. So really for B, what her big wish or whatever to sell her soul was to actually give her own life for Phoebe's, making her a lot more of a complicated and sympathetic character with this gesture that I really like. And there's one big question to B's plan. How does she predict Cole would bed Phoebe? She didn't, she admits, but knew that one day the right girl would come along and appreciate his weirdness. And knew that he wouldn't appreciate a cop-out to get what he wanted, as shortcuts in life don't work, especially in love. Calling back to that whole Faustian undertone to the movie, the gang all made deals with the devil to get what they wanted, and mostly were just talentless idiots, so the shortcut would be their only way to any kind of success. But that has its drawbacks, as we see. Cole's dad makes it, be casually telling him hello, and then he's raised a fine young man to his confusion, wondering where she's been all this time. She knows her deal too has consequences, and goes for the chalice, bemusing there's only winners and losers with this ritual, and that there's one last demon to defeat. She downs a big gulp as she tells them both goodbye, and holds up her finger to do their little E.T. zapping thing from the first movie. She backs away, a growing darkness swirling around her, as her skin peels away, and before long she's dissolved to nothing. Hilariously, his dad did witness this obvious supernatural event, running up in disbelief, screeching, what the hell was that? Cole confirms, yes, he did just see his babysitter disappear into a cloud of darkness, and now believes him whole hog about his crazy story, no longer thinking his boy is insane. I found this development absolutely hysterical. Love me some Ken Marino. Cole offers to show him something he won't believe, doing a grand spin and planting a kiss on Phoebe. His dad is wowed, wanting to take a picture for his mom, who he calls informing her that he's okay. Doing better than okay by the looks of it. Back to school, Cole is looking fresh and confident in his next meeting with Big Carl, and uses the cover story now that Cole made this whole thing up, wisely figuring it's better to keep all of the supernatural shenanigans a secret. Carl suspects that he must have gotten some action, congratulating him on doing the work. He's making strides and getting results, asking him to stand up for a big supportive hug. The ending here reinforces all of the big themes at play. Shortcuts are bad, and adversity builds strength. Unlike Mel, who obviously took the easy route, and her relationship was only an infatuation, Phoebe and Cole have already been through hell together, and have done the hard work to form a real and substantial bond. That was his big arc this time out. In the first film, his romantic inclinations were confused and childlike with B, and this adventure was all about learning how to deal with his new teenage hormones, and to find someone who truly accepts him for the weirdo he is, and evolving emotionally in that sense. Although there is still one very important loose end, the devil's book still sitting on the beach. Our final needle drop of the prog rock yodeling madness of Focus's Hocus Pocus. Nice nod to the thing there in the movie and the magic and what have you. So the book is still sitting there waiting for someone to come and get it and do some other kind of evil shit. As we know, Mick G's whole idea for the babysitter is a three piece kind of arc story wise for Cole's character. So the intent here is definitely to set the stage for a third and presumably final babysitter flick, a climax to the series and for Cole's character arc as well. What I'd like to see is for him to really become the hero this time out. He's shaken off all of his childhood insecurities by the end of Killer Queen, so let's leave that whole awkward nature behind. So let's say that two years later once more, Phoebe is still preoccupied with B and the sacrifice that she made, and wants to go to hell to bring her back to the land of the living. So they set out to find the book for answers of how to do so, but when they get to the beach, it's gone. Sitting them on a chase to track it down, and perhaps learn along the way that the ritual has already been done successfully by someone else, because I think it would be really funny to see Allison and Max and everyone now getting to live their big stupid dreams. And this could be how Cole and Phoebe figure out what's going on, ultimately leading them into hell itself to save B once and for all. It's also funny too, because his dad could get a lot more in on the action this time, but maybe mom still doesn't believe the story, and just writes everything off because, you know, he was high. And so of course, perhaps by the end of three, she too finds out the truth about all the satanic madness that has consumed her son's life. That's all just kind of me spitballing a cool direction, I think, to take the third one, and also to up the stakes into a real climactic scenario. I guess we'll have to wait and see, perhaps another two years. For now, that brings us to the conclusion of this Ending Explained video for The Babysitter Killer Queen. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of The Babysitter Killer Queen and its ending? Did you prefer the original or the sequel? 
And what would you like to see in a final third film? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.